Hi there. Welcome to Ginghamsburg. My name is Fitz. Today is the second week of Lent, and it's also the last weekend of Black History Month. You may know that I am privileged to be the dad of a black daughter and a black son. And I'll tell you what, that has been an eye-opening journey. Like so many other areas of life, there is so much that we are unaware of because, by and large, we can only see what we can see. The moment I became parent of kids with dark skin, I started to see and notice things that I never had before. And if I'm being honest, it stung a little. That's kind of what Lent is. Lent is trying to see the world through God's eyes. But sometimes, we can't see unless we have the humility to slow down, ask questions, and look deep within ourselves to heal our own deep wounds. To understand that we are all sharing this experience we call being human. The beginning of Lent and Black History Month have a unique interconnectedness because it's about making sure we see something that doesn't always get seen. Sometimes intentional, but also sometimes not, certain stories have been left out of our history books. Today, our worship team wants to share a little bit of musical history with you. Maybe for the first time, you'll be able to see the incredible contribution of these special artists to the world of music. James Weldon Johnson, The Commodores, The Temptations, and the staple singers each made an indelible mark on popular music and American history. Let's join our worship team as we celebrate this part of our history together.
Amen. Hey everyone, I'm Pastor Fitz. Whether you're new today, or you've been coming ever since we were a tiny two-room country church way back in the day, welcome to Gingsburg Church. Whatever it is you're looking for, whether it's healing, hope, or help, or just a great conversation, we want to help. If we've already helped you find healing, hope, or help, then whatever you do, don't tell anybody. I mean, that's what Jesus told several people after he healed them, but what did they do? They went and told everyone they knew. So don't tell anybody, got it? Good. Now, go tell everybody, <laughs> because in six short weeks, we have a really easy invite for you to make. It's called Easter. <laughs> have you heard of it? It's a pretty big deal. You know, there are two times a year where almost anyone is willing to come to church. What are those two times? Yeah, of course, Christmas and Easter. But there's a problem. Those who have been in church for a long time have what's called bubble of It's It's ancient Greek for when you simply run out of opportunities to invite people to church because you've already invited everyone you know. Well, consider this your opportunity to shake things up a little. We'll celebrate at four different worship times at the Tip City campus on Easter weekend, one at the Fort McKinley campus that Sunday morning, two television slots, and we'll be optimizing the snot out of the summary content on our YouTube channel so people looking for healing, hope, or help can find it with us. If you don't know what optimizing the snot out of the summary content means, it, it basically means it's easy for people to find us. <laughs> and it gets better. The week before Easter, we're hosting a giant Easter egg hunt. Like, huge, colossal, gargantuan even. Because people who love Jesus go above and beyond for their neighbors. The egg hunt and Easter weekend are all hands on deck opportunities. Every single person in here needs to sign up to serve. Thank you for being God's hands and feet. When you serve, you create the space for others to experience God, and you might just discover your calling along the way. And it's no secret that your giving impacts everything we do. Thank you for making Ingensburg Church a place where hurting people can experience the love and grace of Jesus Christ. You can make a contribution to God's work at Gingisburg at gingisburg.org slash give. Now, get out your Bibles and open it to the book of John. Let's find out together what it really means to follow Jesus. Well, it is so good to be with you, my brothers and sisters, this weekend. One of the, the greatest joys that I've had in my whole life was being pastor here for over 38 years. And so I got to hear a lot of your stories. And I love to hear how Jesus was impacting your lives, your families, your marriages. You know, we all come to a lifestyle of, of faith through people sharing their stories um, by their words and, and actions. Take, take a moment and think, who were the people who shared their story of how they met Jesus and how that influenced your life? Well, today's story, we're, we're reading about uh, Jesus meeting a Samaritan woman at a well at, at noon, and he begins to reveal to her uh, kind of the mess her life was in. Uh, he said, uh, go bring your husband. And she said, well, I don't have a husband. And he says, you're right. You were married five different times. And now the dude you're living with is not your husband. So she runs. I mean, she sees this incredible love in, in Jesus and, and the offer he's making to her life. And I'm going to pick it up. Fourth chapter, 39th verse. So many of the Samaritans from that town believed in Jesus because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them. And he stayed two days. And because of the words 
many more, because of the words of the woman, many more came to believe in him. Now, will you take a moment and pray with me? Lord, open our ears that we may hear, our eyes that we may see, and our hearts that we may receive and know your incredible love in Jesus' name. Now, you know, one of the things in, in this woman's story that I have to ask about my own life is why does Jesus bring up her past? She goes, he told me everything I ever did and the past wasn't so great. Well, take a look at this picture. In 2014, we were moving my mother out of the uh, condo she shared with my father into an apartment in a senior living facility. Was we were going through her stuff, these old papers of mine turned up with these grades. Now, this, this was only uh, not that many years ago. And so my mom gets mad all over again. It was, was amazing. I go, Mom, I've got my doctorate. You used to accuse me of never reading a book. I write books. But just looking at, at, at those papers, that was so much of my identity. I, the date on one shows it was even my senior year in high school. And this is who I believed I was. It, it's what I could achieve in my life. Now, we all have suppressed uh, hurtful memories that, that are both self-inflicted and, and pain that has been caused by others. And just like in myself, for this woman, it creates this false identity that we're separated from God's love or that we don't have any identity in who God has made us to be. And, and we look at this woman, obviously she had a rather storied past, uh, and, and this is who she began to believe she was. Uh, you know, a divorcee, a prostitute, who, who knows? Because most women didn't come to a well at noon in the midst of the heat. They gathered in kind of a community in the morning and shared identities with each other. Well, you know, this false identity that, that we have, this false picture of ourself, becomes a means of defense that we project judgment, uh, our judgment, on others. So what has to happen, there has to be a healing of our past before we can live fully into God's preferred future. Now, what we need to do, all of us, and I see this happening in our nation right now, is we've got to move beyond religion to a relationship. You know, religion is external. It's transactional. It's like we believe if we do the right things, if we pray the right, pray the right prayer, if we, if we make the right confession that Jesus is Lord, that God will love us. But we have to do something before God will love us. It's also divisive. You even see in, in, in verse 19 that the woman wants to kind of deflect what Jesus is calling her to. And she says, uh, our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. So it divides us. There's over 34,000 denominations in the world, and it's all about who has the right theology. You know, one of my favorite stories in the Bible, it's in the ninth chapter of John. There was a, a blind beggar who would sit by the road, and Jesus saw this, this beggar, and um, he went over an amazing way he healed this man. Often healing comes in ways we don't expect. But he spit in mud and made this salve and put it on the guy's eyes. Well, it healed him. Now, the religious correct, the orthodox, went nuts because he did this on a Sabbath. See, everything about his religion is about external rules uh, that we use against each other. So they came to this man and they said, well, who was this that healed you? And, and the man goes, well, I guess he's a prophet. He didn't have the right theology. He was not fully co correct. And then they come back to him again and say, tell us, 
this man who did this is a sinner. He did it on the Sabbath. And I love this. This is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. He said, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. You see, that is a relationship. That, that is knowing God's love. You know, when we just stick with religion, we end up committing spiritual violence in Jesus' name. We, we, we saw that in Jan, uh, January 6th in the Capitol building. Uh, we project this self-judgment on other people. You know, when Carolyn and I were pastoring here, uh, the Lord just opened me up and, and we said one night, um, we said this in worship, we said, if you're part of the LGBTQ community, you're welcome to our home on Sunday night, a safe place without hate. And, and I was surprised, 25 people showed up. And all we did for two hours was listen to their story, listen to their pain, you know, of, of how they felt violence in, in Jesus' name that was projected against them. You know, the whole point of this story is grace comes first. Grace is transformational and not transactional. Did you get that? I'm going to say it again. Grace is transformational and not trans transactional. I, I want to read from the eighth chapter of uh, Romans. Listen to this. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life neither angels or demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither heights nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation. Well, that's you too. You can't even separate yourself from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. That's what the new birth is. It's not uh, praying a prayer so that now God loves and accepts you, it's waking up to the fact. It's getting rid of that false identity. That's why Jesus said you have to lose yourself, your false self, to find yourself. And so now we discover that who we are in God, that Christ lives in us, that we share the divine nature, and we're not isolated, we're part of a community and we're part of creation that we're fearfully and wonderfully made. We realize that we are a part of a greater whole. Well, let me tell you a, a way that God is doing that in my life, how we become more a vessel of the gospel instead of an opinion on a Facebook post. This past year, has really during this pandemic been hard on me. Because as you saw my old false identity that I was a failure, uh, I weighed 124 pounds when I graduated from high school, kids told me I looked like fetus wearing gym shoes. Um, you know, I'd never been a prom. I mean, that was, was, was my identity. And now it, it comes this identity that, that not only can I be part of a team, the, the, the team of Jesus, but I can be a starter on the team of Jesus. And, and God's using me in these incredible ways and I'm writing books and I'm, I'm, I'm speaking uh, all around the world. And now this past year during this pandemic, I haven't been out speaking since the first week of March. And I've, my next birthday, I'm gonna be 70 years old. I'm gonna be, I'm almost dead. And the Lord saying, no, Mike, this is a time where I'm getting rid of another part of your false self is that your identity has been based on doing. And right now you can't do. So now I'm taking you to the next place of who you are in me. It's about being. So folks, this relationship with Jesus continues. You know, you're going to hear that last week, Pastor Rachel talked about provenient grace when you're not even aware. This is justifying grace when we because when we wake up to the grace that's there 
And we're going to hear in weeks to come about sanctifying grace. It's what God's still doing in this almost 70-year-old, showing me it's not about doing, it's about being. So I want to encourage you all today to, to realize that you need to do nothing to earn Jesus' love. It's there. Wake up to it and discover your new self. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Pastor Mike. If you'd like to go deeper and reflect on the content of today's message with others, you can visit bit.ly slash Bible on Zoom to register for a weekly Bible study online. If you have a son or daughter in middle or high school, tell them I'll see them this Friday evening in the Avenue for Nerf Wars. You'll also want to nudge your kids to participate in a couple other upcoming opportunities like our Young Believers class and a chance to love on some nursing home residents. All that more on the Gingensburg app. Well, that's it for me. Oh, wait, one more thing. Don't forget to invite someone to join you on Easter. Have a great week.